six-time Stanley Cup champion and the author of No One Wins Alone, Mark Messier, is in the house. Hey, man, how are you? Hey, my brothers, what's going on? Good to be with you. Well, we are over here packing the foil, getting ready to play some old-style hockey over this book, okay? <laughs> Here's, okay, that sounds good. Back in the foil. I love it. Here we go. I got the, the Hanson brothers are following you around today. It's going to be a tough one. We're putting in the enforcers. Um, I am, uh, as a guy, you should know this, I grew up uh, in New York, and I was a longtime cab driver before I made it to Fox and got on the radio and got on TV. And I will tell you that to this day, even though I'm from here and I'm a native of New York, no one has ever given me a free ride in a cab. And I was reading early on in your book how somebody <laughs> gave you a free ride. And I was like, that's BS, man. Yeah, what's going on with that? Yeah, I was as surprised as anybody, to be honest with you, that uh, even recognized me. But uh, I think it goes to show what uh, or how important that championship was in New York and how it resonated with many different people. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And I, but I just I want you to know, in the interest of full disclosure, because I grew up on Long Island, about a block from the Nassau Coliseum, I would have charged you in my cab. Of course. But that's that's what makes hockey and the sport so beautiful. Everybody has their favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I would have charged you and your Potvin sucks chant all the way for the ride to the garden. Um, and I would have I would have smiled and paid you double. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. Well, listen, I'm thrilled to have you on. The book is great. I want to dive right in on a couple of things that I really was fascinated by uh, in this book. And one of the things uh, that jumped out at me right out of the gate is the fact that you talked about something. It's a term I use a lot on the radio when I'm talking to people. I call it family privilege. And what I mean is probably more important than money or anything else is if you have a family infrastructure that actually preaches accountability and ambition you have a competitive advantage in life that I don't think we put enough emphasis on. Would you agree with that? Well, I can only speak from my own experience mm -hmm. and that I was very lucky uh, for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. One is uh, my mom and dad got married. My mom was 17. My dad was 21. Mm -hmm. had four kids in five years. And we basically grew up together. We were a really close family knit uh, unit. We traveled together. We holidayed together. We did everything together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, and and then, and then on top of that, my dad was a hockey player, so I got an unbelievable education in the game of hockey from many different perspectives. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I think uh, the early on upbringing of uh, of anybody in a in a in a family environment that uh, is uh, close knit like that is very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that uh, you know, I played with many uh, players that didn't have that, yeah. and uh, and uh, you know, like I say, it's uh, every player has uh, challenges and hurdles they have to overcome to make it anywhere, and and certainly we saw uh, examples of that over the years. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, I, I I always say, you know, I have my wife and I. We have one kid. Uh, the state would never let us have two. You know. <laughs> They, okay. you know, they saw that first report card and they were like, yeah, you guys, are, you can't breed anymore. That's that. Uh, but no, I, I, I do feel that as parents, you know, we play such a bigger role than a lot of people realize. We're all the captain of our own house. And uh, I just I love that you wrote at length about your family. Another thing I wanted to ask you, though, about your upbringing. Now, when you were talking about, you know, the incredible experience of playing in Madison Square Garden and how you had such a reverence for the place as a kid. Did you really cry when Muhammad Ali lost the decision to Joe Frazier in 1973? I was a huge uh, Muhammad Ali fan. I, I just couldn't believe what a uh -huh. what a personality had, uh, what he stood for. Um, wow. You know, he was just incredibly uh, inspiring as a, as a yeah. young fella. Um, and I did. I listened to the uh, Madison Square Garden fight uh, in, in uh, 1970. Yeah, I that's believe. what it was uh, the first one. Yeah, and it was it was amazing. Uh, <laughs> on a transistor radio under my pillow because I was supposed to be asleep going to bed uh, before before school. But uh, yeah, that was uh, really disappointing. But you know what's even more important about that is that when I finally did get to meet the uh, childhood idol of mine, uh, oh. he uh, far exceeded every expectation I had of a per of a person. He was a beautiful man. Uh, he just was so engaging, so accommodating, just. Mm -hmm. was one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah, it's amazing, and he was the man. And uh, I kind of relate, because I cried when Mike Tyson lost to Buster Douglas, but only because I had bet the fight. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, there's always different emotions that come up with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. If you're just joining us, Mark Messier is on the line. His new book is called No One Wins Alone. Uh, no, it is not a dating app. It is a, a recollection of his time in the NHL, and I do. I love the book. Uh, one of the things you talked about that I thought was fascinating is because this book really is honing on in on the importance of teamwork, is you drew a comparison that a lot of our listeners, who if, if they aren't necessarily sports fans, uh, 
they could see where this comparison would hold up, you were talking about the Rolling Stones and how they're really a great metaphor for the importance of teamwork. And I actually thought it was a br- it was a brilliant comparison because you can't be the Rolling Stones if the team doesn't have clubhouse chemistry, right? Well, I I wrote about them because first of all, I, I, I love the Rolling Stones. Uh, you know, they've been together a long time. They'd seen a lot, uh, done a lot, experienced a lot. And to your point, uh, you know, everything that a hockey team uh, has to go through, uh, you know, a band like that has to, you know, is, is, is faced with the same challenges. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, can they sustain themselves over an extended period of time? Uh, does the ego get in the way? Uh, distractions, all the things that uh, we know that have come to tear apart teams. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just been remarkable to see the band and what they've stood for, and they can c- continue to uh, – uh, uh, you know, even tour to this day, which uh, the staying power has been amazing. But uh, you know, you gotta you gotta give up uh, yourself uh, when you enter into a team sport or a band or anything else. Uh, it's all about the the uh, the collective, and uh, you know, they've nobody's done it better than them. Now, do you think uh, you could have played as many seasons in the NHL as you did if you had the same pregame ritual as Keith Richards? Uh, I gave it my best, and I was able to play 26 years. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great answer. That's a great. That's a, that's a great answer. Okay. Well, we talk about you playing, which is obviously you know here in New York. I always laugh because when people say like, "Oh, Messier, he'll never have to buy a beer again," that's also not a good thing. Sometimes, you know. Well, <laughs> for me, I came to New York. That, that's that's true. Uh, I came to New York at probably the perfect time of my career, anyways. And for me, as a person with at least a a little bit of maturity, uh, mm-hmm. enough to know that what I needed to do in order to get ready to play. And I also had enough uh, maturity to understand that uh, the most important thing coming to New York was to try to win a championship. So everything else took a took a back seat. But don't uh, feel sorry for me. I, I was not shortchanged on, on the good times New York had to offer. <laughs> I, 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 I had my share of, uh, of uh, fun times uh, all the while playing some Great hockey and ultimately right. winning that championship. No, it was a, and, and none of us will ever forget it. It was incredible. Um, talking about the importance of teamwork then, I was going to ask you this one. Um, and you didn't play through this, uh, but it's something that's very much a, a part of the modern sports landscape. As a guy who is as big as you are on, on, on the importance of team, um, are you a fan of vaccine mandates or do you think the players should be choosing for themselves? Like, Where, where do you find yourself if you were active right now? Oh, geez, that's a good, great question. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just a crazy, uh, uh, you know, controversial topic. Um, you know, I guess going on to ESPN, they said, I don't care what you, you believe in, but you have to have an opinion. <laughs> 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 I guess that comes with the territory. But, uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, uh, it, it the, the, this one's hard uh, for a number of reasons. One is uh, you never know what underlying uh, health the uh, uh, factors some players may or may not have mm-hmm. but ultimately uh you know uh you're not getting vaccinated for yourself you're get, getting vaccinated to protect the uh, people around you mm-hmm. as well so uh it's another one of those selfless acts that has to be uh you know thought about uh you know when you're playing on a team amongst a team in a league mm-hmm. and uh and, and you know it, it, you always surrender, surrender yourself for the for the bigger uh for the bigger oh, okay. uh, team so, or bigger group, but mm-hmm. it's, it's tough. I get that it's tough, and then I say that okay because it's interesting because you know the big debate here in New York right now is Kyrie Irving on the Brooklyn Nets, a phenomenal player. Um, you know he doesn't want to get the vaccine because he feels like he's already had COVID, and um, you know uh, there's a lot of people on the other side of the aisle saying you know but you should because you do have to give yourself up for the good of the team. And my guess is if you were playing, that's where you would find yourself, as if you yourself were against it, you'd pro- or at least on the fence, you would probably give yourself up for the good of the team. Well, look, at there's choices and consequences. You can make any choice you want, then you just got to you know, you know, deal with whatever the consequences come your way. So yeah. for me, I'd decide, I'd decide whether what I want to do, not to get a vaccine or play. If I wanted to play, these are the rules that I have to play by. I mean, it's a... Uh, it's a big sandbox, and you know <laughs> there are rules. <laughs> there are things that you have to follow, and and if that's what's mandated by the league, and I want to be a part of the league, that's what I got to do. Now, if I choose not to do that, that's fine too. It's you know it's it's your choice. You're you know everybody has the right to choose what they want to do, but yeah, you know you, you, you know that's that's kind of where, where I lay with okay. it. Okay, that's fair. No, that's fair. That's a great answer too. Um, if you're just joining us, Mark Messier is on the line. Uh, his fantastic new book is called No One Wins Alone. I wanted to ask you this because you were talking about 
how Wayne Gretzky called you on the phone in the locker room when you knew you were getting ready to play uh, what would be your last game in the NHL. And you guys spoke about retirement and how one of the upsides was, you know, all of the holiday celebrations you missed during your playing career uh, would now be on the schedule. But my question to you is, do you ever catch yourself hanging out with your family like two hours too long going, man, if only I had a game to get me out of this? <laughs> well, <laughs> he did phone me and it was a nice uh, uh, conversation and, uh, you know, just wanted to wish me luck. He had been through it himself, so he knew what I was <laughs> up against, uh, you know, closing the uh, career out. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we were lucky to have a family that uh, had all the uh, usual uh, uh, family uh, 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 dust-ups, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> the gloves went down, huh? No, I love it. I grew oh, up yeah. in one of those, too. <laughs> uh, that's, that, that, that's all part of it. It's all part of the learning process and, you know, getting having something happen, getting over it and, you know, yep. how it is. But, uh, no, I loved our uh, family uh, gatherings at uh, all the holidays there. My mom always made them special. She went overboard to uh, decorate the house for every occasion. It was, and uh, and, and the, the celebrations uh, were uh, were rich with the uh, with uh, lots of uh, lots of drama and lots of laugh and lots of crying and lots of love uh, at our house. Oh, I bet. Now we we uh, I got to tell you, I, I grew up in a very very similar environment, so I get it. You, you know, you really are playing a full season every year. Is a is a new season, a new <laughs> new championship quest. Uh, so this last question I will ask in, in in honor of some people in my family who are big uh, car people. Did you ever hold on? Did you hold on to that nine thirty turbo uh, that you had gotten uh, when you first signed uh, your first big contract, or did you move on? Oh my goodness! You you uh, you hit a sensitive spot with me. Oh, One man. of my favorite cars. I, uh, I I actually had it shipped to New York and drove it for a year or two here in New York. And the road, as you know, the roads and keeping <laughs> it in an underground uh, parking garage. It, yeah. I just felt so bad. It was, the car wasn't being treated properly, and I ended up. Uh, I think I might have shipped it back and sold it to somebody. I can't remember, <laughs> uh, but I. The biggest mistake of my life was letting that car go. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you, there's no car in the world that would be better off if only it was driven on the streets of New York a little bit more, you know? This is uh... <laughs> yeah. well. Well, there's a few, there's a few of them, but that one was special for yeah. a lot of different reasons. But uh, yeah, agree. that that uh, that was a that was a tough day. Yeah, and no, I was fantastic. I I, lo- I love the story though about you spinning it out because uh, I I listen. I have great reverence for those cars, and uh, the thing about the mid-engined car is uh, there is sometimes a little bit of a delay on that gas pedal, and you do things, and uh, you know the next thing you know you're in a viral video for the wrong reason. So I'm glad you made it out. Yeah, well, a little, little bit of understeer, a little yep. bit of uh, lag in the yep. turbo, and next thing you know, uh, <laughs> tried to cut that uh, traffic circle a little too tight. <laughs> hey, man, it's a long season. Nobody goes undefeated, right? That's um, right. That's right. Listen, that's right. It is a, a fantastic book. Uh, it is called No One Wins Alone. I, it was really a high honor to have you on the show today. I do believe our engineer Josh has fainted because he's a big Rangers guy. He's got a foam finger on in the booth. Minimal amount of face paint, you know, because we're in a work environment. But uh, this was a win for all of us, so thank you for your time today. Hey, I appreciate being on with you. And Josh, uh, tell Josh I said hello and let's uh, let's go Rangers. There it is! There it is! He actually <laughs> did faint now, so I'll go revive him. Thanks, Matthew. You're the man.